ask that we all bow in prayer, every head bowed and every eye closed. Our Father and our God, we thank thee tonight for America and for the faith of our fathers that made this country and all of its liberties possible. And we pray that in this hour of crisis, that we Americans might return to the faith of our fathers, that it might live still from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And we pray tonight that thou wouldst use the telecast Use the message in song, word, and prayer to stir the hearts of millions of Americans to their need of faith in Christ. We pray that we shall see no man save Jesus Christ tonight. May he be exalted and magnified, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Now tonight I want you to turn with me to the 14th chapter of the book of Ezekiel the 14th chapter of the book of Ezekiel. How many have your Bibles? Lift them up. Wonderful. Look at the Bibles. All right. The, fifth, the 14th and the 14th verse. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord. Last summer, I heard another young evangelist who influenced me a great deal in my early life by the name of Jimmy Johnson preach from this text one of the most unusual sermons I've ever heard. And tonight, I want to use it as a background for the message that I believe that God has laid upon my heart to give to you on this Memorial Day weekend. Here are three men in this chapter and it is a chapter of judgment. God says, I'm going to judge the nation. I'm going to judge the people. Because of your sins and your wickedness, I will destroy you. But he said, there are three men that I would spare if they were living today. Only three. He said, those three are Noah, Job, and Daniel. Now, why did God choose those three men? Above all the other men that had ever lived, God said, in case judgment falls upon the nation, I would spare those three. I wouldn't spare their families, says God, but I would spare them because they were such righteous men. I believe that he chose those three because Noah overcame the world. We are told that we have three enemies. Every Christian here tonight has three enemies. The world, the devil, and the flesh. And if you will study the life of Noah, you'll find that Noah, by faith, overcame the world. The world lost its attraction and its appeal to Noah, and by faith, he built an ark to the saving of his household. God says, because Noah had such faith and overcame the attraction of the world, I would spare Noah in the day of judgment. Then God said, I would spare Job. Because Job, in a contest with the devil, overcame the devil. Satan took everything that Job had, and yet Job said, though he slay me, I will yet trust him. And in spite of all the things that the devil did against Job, he still trusted God. And God said, if Job were living in the time of judgment, I would save Job. The third man, the man that I want to talk about tonight a bit, was Daniel. God said, if judgment should come to Israel and Daniel were living, I would spare Daniel because Daniel overcame the flesh. Daniel had many temptations of the flesh, but Daniel, by faith, overcame them all. And God said, in case judgment should come, I would spare Daniel. I would spare Noah because he overcame the world. I would spare Job because he overcame the devil. I would spare Daniel because he overcame the flesh. Tonight, I want you to turn with me to the fifth chapter of the book of Daniel. 
And I want to see one incident in the life of Daniel as an illustration for what I have to say to all of you tonight. Here is the setting. Daniel had been carried away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem had been ransacked by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Jerusalem had been destroyed because of her sins and her wickedness and her moral pollution. God had allowed a heathen, materialistic, pagan nation to bring destruction upon his own people. And I want to tell you something tonight, America. God has not changed. And the same God that allowed a pagan, idolatrous nation to bring judgment upon Israel, God may also allow a pagan, idolatrous nation to bring judgment upon America unless we are willing to repent of our sins. And the greatest need in America tonight is not a bigger air force. Our greatest need tonight is not bigger hydrogen bombs and more missiles. The greatest need in America tonight is a return to faith in God. A spiritual awakening. Young people by the thousands marching under the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you something. Those men that died on Iwo Jima and Okinawa and the jungles of New Guinea and the sands of North Africa and the battlefields of Normandy, I'm sure that tonight they are saying something to us. They are saying, America, return to your faith in God and the principles that made you great. Because I tell you as I stand here, that God is not going to spare us. God is not going to defend us unless we turn to Him. And we are in for sure judgment unless we repent of our sins and turn to His Son, Jesus Christ. There is no alternative. It is either revival or judgment. And we need on this Memorial Day weekend, instead of spending our time at the nightclubs and the bars, instead of spending our time in riotous living, we ought to be on our knees in all-night prayer meetings across this country tonight, asking God to forgive us for our sins and turning to God before it's too late as a nation. You know, God was going to destroy Nineveh in judgment at one time. God told Jonah, go and preach to Nineveh that I'm going to destroy Nineveh unless Nineveh repents. And the judgment hand of God was falling, but it was stayed in midair because Nineveh repented from the king on down in sackcloth and ashes and Nineveh was spared the coming judgment. I tell you, America tonight can be spared. I've talked to many of our national leaders during the past year and I find a terrible pessimism among most of them. This is a serious and critical hour, more serious and more critical than the average America knows. And I'm convinced tonight that if we knew the full truth of what is taking place in the world, we would be alarmed. And one man said to me, we would become panicked in this country. There would be a panic. This is a critical and dark hour with the forces of materialism coming ever closer. And we Americans are going on as though nothing unusual were happening and as though we were going to live forever. I tell you, the day of reckoning is coming unless we turn to God. And God is our only defense. I'm not trusting in a big air force and I'm not trusting in all of these weapons that are being devised to protect us. I'm not trusting in retaliation. My trust tonight is in God. He is our defense. But I tell you, God cannot defend us unless we return to him. And when Jerusalem was destroyed, Daniel was one of the captives and he was taken over to Babylon. And there he grew because he had purposed in his heart he would not defile himself. He would not compromise with any of the sins and evils of Babylon. He was 1,500 miles from home in a pagan country. But he would not compromise. He purposed in his heart as a young man that he was going to live for God. And do you know what happened to Daniel? He was made prime minister in six empires or six kingdoms. He became prime minister. 
of all of Babylon. He ruled Babylon under the king. God took him to the top. And any young man, any young woman that will put their trust in Jesus Christ and dedicate your creative energies to him, God will bless you. And God will help you. And God will give you supernatural energy above your fellows. But now Nebuchadnezzar, the great emperor, is dead. And reigning in his stead is his young grandson by the name of Belshazzar. Belshazzar is now the king of Babylon. And Babylon had been under siege by the Medo-Persian armies that had surrounded the city, but the Medo-Persian armies could not take the city because the Euphrates River came under the walls of Babylon and flowed through the city and they had enough room inside the walls to raise their crops and they had plenty of water and they could withstand the siege. At that time, Babylon was still the greatest empire in the world. And the walls around Babylon were so thick that twelve chariots could ride abreast. And it was pierced by a hundred bronze gates with soldiers standing guard and watch day and night. And one morning, Belshazzar the king woke up and saw that the Medo-Persian army had melted away. And he thought to himself, we've won a mighty victory. And so, he decided to celebrate. He decided to have a banquet. He decided to have a banquet that would be more lavish than any banquet ever held in the history of Babylon. He was going to have this banquet in the low-hanging gardens built by Nebuchadnezzar, one of the seven wonders of the world. So he called his servants together and he said, Now, I want you to get the finest wines, the rarest foods, the finest dancers in all the empire, and we're going to invite in a thousand lords and ladies. And we're going to have a party... We're going to have a banquet that is beyond anything Babylon has ever seen. And so they made their plan. And I can see that night in Babylon. The moon is riding high in the sky. A soft and gentle breeze sweeps through the banquet hall. The low-hanging chandeliers. The beautiful drapes. The orchestra is playing. The dancers are dancing. Belshazzar and all of his lords and ladies laughing, having a wonderful time. Oh, the Bible says you can have pleasure in sin. I've had a lot of people say, well, you don't really have a good time in the world. I, I think a lot of people do. The Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. You can have a good time for a little bit. But then the Bible said it's all over. Soon the eternal hangover begins. How many people come in from a party late at night you thought you've had a good time. You come in empty, dissatisfied, more frustrated than ever before, wishing that you could find something in life that would satisfy beyond that which you've been doing. Belshazzar had a party. And what a banquet it was. And on into the night it went. And as the wine began to go to his head, Belshazzar decided to do something that startled all of his guests. He ordered all the golden and silver vessels of God that had been taken off the altar in the temple in Jerusalem, brought in and given to the guests and ordered them to drink wine from it. In other words, he was shaking his fist in God's face. He was defying God himself. He was saying, God, I don't need you. I'm the king of Babylon. I rule Babylon. This is the greatest empire in the world. And he was defying God himself. We Americans are defying God tonight. We are saying by the way we live, we don't need you, God. Oh, we believe in God intellectually. Almost everybody today accepts the fact of God. But we don't live for him. Jesus said, you serve me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. And that is the sin of America tonight. We go to church. We have our names on church rolls. But we've never really had an experience with Christ. We've never been born again. We've never had an encounter with the living God. And we don't live for him. We are not living for Jesus Christ 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the month. Belshazzar defied God by the way he lived and by his actions. 
We don't need you, God. I imagine Belshazzar believed in God, but that's as far as it went. And so the party went on into the night. And all of a sudden, something happened. It'll always happen because God says there will be a day of reckoning. Now, Belshazzar was guilty of all kinds of sins. He was guilty of the sin of pride. He was guilty of the sin of immorality. He was guilty of desecrating the holy vessels of God. He was guilty of drunkenness. He was guilty of all these sins. And the Bible says you can get away with it. Ah, yes, you can go ahead and sin and get away with it. Keep on. You can get away with it for a while. But the Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The Bible says, and they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. The Bible says, for they have sown the wind and they reap the whirlwind. The Bible again says, they have sown wheat, but they shall reap thorns. You sow wheat, but you're going to reap thorns. You've sown to the wind, but you're going to reap a whirlwind by the life you live. Oh, you're, having, you're getting away with it now. You may get away with it for a year, two years, three years, four years, five years, but soon judgment comes. God said there'll be a day of reckoning. And Belshazzar, at the height of his career, in good health, having the time of his life, suddenly stops. He had called a servant to him and he said, pour me some more wine. And he poured the wine. And he stood up and he said a toast to the gods of hay, wood, and stubble. In other words, idolatry. Just as he stood up to drink the toast, the scripture says that he suddenly stopped and he began to turn white. His knees began to shake. The banquet hall became quiet. A woman screamed and fainted. And Belshazzar the king was emperor of an empire, but he was afraid by what he saw. Because he saw a strange sight. He saw an armless hand writing on the wall in letters of fire. And Belshazzar the king was afraid. This was something he couldn't understand. And he tried to read the writing and he couldn't. And finally he sent for the soothsayers and the philosophers and the intellectuals, the wise men, the professors of the universities to come in and try to interpret the writing to him. They looked at the writing. They tried to decipher it. The greatest brains of the day tried to read it, but they couldn't understand it. And they said, O king, we cannot understand this writing. And Belshazzar said, Get out! And he was more afraid than ever. Do you know why they couldn't read that writing? I'll tell you. That was God's handwriting. And the Bible says that the wisdom of this world is foolishness. God hath made foolish the wisdom of this world. And that's the reason many people don't understand the Bible. They don't understand the Bible because the Bible is written by the Holy Spirit. The Bible was inspired by men of God, written by the Holy Spirit, and men do not understand it. They cannot make it out. And the Bible teaches that it's foolishness unto man. Our intellectuals today are trying to figure a way out, but they cannot because... This was done by the Holy Spirit. And only the Spirit of God can properly interpret the Scriptures. Only the Spirit of God can teach you what God is saying. And so Belshazzar was afraid nobody could read the writing. Then his mother came in. Thank God for mothers who believe. His mother came in and said, Belshazzar, I know a man that can read the writing." I know a man that can make known this thing. That man's name is Daniel. He used to work for your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. He knows how to read this. Call him in. And so Belshazzar said, bring in Daniel. And Daniel came in. Great, strong Daniel. Notice one thing. Daniel wasn't at that party that night. He wasn't participating in the sins of the flesh that night. Daniel was probably away praying somewhere. 
He'd slipped along with God that night when all of Babylon had turned out to celebrate the great party and banquet of Belshazzar the king. The Bible says that we are to separate ourselves from the things of the world. The Bible says that if we're a friend of the world, we're no friend of God. And I tell you, the Bible tells us that there are certain things we are to do if we're Christians, but the Bible also says there are certain things we are not to do. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The Bible teaches that the world system, as we know it, is not a friend of God. And we are to live in it, but we are not to partake of its evil deeds. We are to be separated from it. And God is calling upon us today to be separated from the evil deeds of this world. Daniel had separated himself from the evil deeds of Belshazzar that night. But isn't it strange when something like that happens, they called for Daniel the prophet? Isn't it strange that when trouble comes to your home or death comes, you always call for the minister? Why don't you call for the bartender? That's where you spent most of your time. Isn't it strange? He called for the preacher. Belshazzar called for the preacher in his moment of peril, in his critical end crisis. He calls for the minister. And Daniel comes in. And Belshazzar said, Daniel, do you see that writing on the wall? If you'll read that writing, I'll put a gold chain around your neck. I'll make you the third rule in the empire. I'll make you a great man, Daniel, if you'll read that writing. And Daniel looked at it and a smile played across his face. He knew whose handwriting that was. He'd seen it many times. That was God's handwriting. And he said, Belshazzar, I'll read it for you. Here's what it says. It says, Mini, Tekel, you person, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Belshazzar, you've lived your own life the way you want to live it. Now the day of judgment has come. You've been weighed in God's balances all these years that you thought you were getting away with it. God was reading your motives and thoughts and intents. God was weighing you. And Belshazzar, you don't weigh enough. Belshazzar, the day of reckoning has come. Judgment is about to fall. You're being weighed in God's balances. I tell you tonight that America is being weighed in the balances of God. As a nation, we've been guilty of every sin that man has ever been able to conceive. There is not a sin that has ever been committed in the history of the world that isn't being committed this night in America. I tell you, we'll not get away with it. The handwriting is on the wall. The time of repentance has come. The time of a return to national faith has come. The time to turn to God has come. And if we don't, the judgment that God predicts will fall upon us. And it will fall upon us as individuals and as a people and as a family. The most patriotic thing you can do this night is to give your life to Jesus Christ. You want to do something for those men that died on battlefields in our wars past that paid with their blood for the liberty that we enjoy tonight, then give your life to Jesus Christ and follow and serve Him. Go to church and take your place tomorrow morning in the pew where you belong, and you'll be doing more for your nation and for the world at large and for better understanding and the bettering of human relations that we must have if we are to have peace than anything you could possibly do. But I'm not asking you to become a Christian tonight and to give your life to Jesus Christ and to go to church just to spare America. That's too low a motive. I'm asking you to come to Jesus Christ tonight because you're a sinner in need of repentance. I'm asking you to come to Jesus Christ tonight because he died on the cross and he loves you and he wants to forgive you of your past sins and he wants to take you to heaven. But more than that, he wants to give you a new, thrilling, joyous life here and now. Give your life to him tonight. Let us see what happened. Weighed in the balances of God. God is weighing you tonight. Every one of you, the scripture says, God is weighing. 
He's weighing us by certain standards. How is God going to judge us and how is he going to weigh us? He's going to weigh us, first of all, by the Ten Commandments. You say, well, Billy, I've never murdered anybody. I've never stolen anything that I know about. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. You have broken the laws of God. You have broken the Ten Commandments. If you've ever had hate in your heart, you've broken the Ten Commandments. If you've ever had lust in your heart, you've broken the Ten Commandments, and in God's sight, you're guilty. You're just as guilty as the man that gets drunk, just as guilty as the man that commits adultery, just as guilty as the man that kills or steals, because God judges our thoughts and motives and intents, and God is weighing us tonight. And I want to ask you, by the standard of the Ten Commandments, how much do you weigh? Do you weigh enough to get to heaven? And then God weighs us for the great law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul, and thy neighbor as thyself. This is the great command. How do you stand before that? Have you always loved God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul? Have you always at all times loved your neighbor as yourself? If not, you've come short, and you're a sinner tonight in need of repentance. Because God is weighing you by the great commandment. And then God is weighing you by Christ. For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? To whom will ye liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be like thee? Be ye holy for I am holy. God is a holy God. The Lord Jesus Christ is a holy Christ. And God is going to weigh you in comparison to Christ. Do you live as holy as Christ lives? You say, of course not. Then you're a sinner. Because God judges every man according to his Son, Jesus Christ. And if you fall short of Christ, you're a sinner in need of repentance. The word sin means that you come short of God's standard. And God's standard is Christ. How much do you weigh in comparison to Christ? Oh, you say, well, Billy, I come short of Christ. I don't live as good as Christ. Then you need to repent. You need to come to Christ. And ask him to forgive you because you failed to meet God's moral requirement as expressed in Christ. And then God is weighing you by something else. He's weighing you by your works. You know, I sometimes stop and think about the sins of omission that we're going to be judged by that we don't even think about sometimes. For I was a hungered and you gave me meat and I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in, naked, and ye clothed me not, sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily, I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not unto one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. In other words, here was a man that needed clothes, and you just didn't give it to him. You neglected. Here was a person that needed a smile, and you just passed on by. You were too busy. Here was a sick person that needed to be visited, but you were just too busy to go to the hospital and give them a word of cheer. Jesus said, someday you shall be judged by the things you didn't do. Here was a man in your community of another race that needed your encouragement. But because of your prejudice, you couldn't go and help him. You neglected. You were afraid to take a moral stand. In your community, there are thousands of people with spiritual needs. People that need to be one to Jesus Christ. But because you're too busy, you're too self-occupied, you haven't had time to go witness for Jesus Christ. And there are people that are lost that you could have helped, but you haven't helped them. You neglected, you're guilty of the sins of omission. And the sins of omission are just as great as the sins of omission. It's just as wrong to neglect to do something that you should have done as it is to go out and commit a murder. And how many of us tonight are guilty? I tell you, God shall judge us and weigh us by the sins of omission. And then God is going to weigh us by our opportunities. 
To whom much is given, much is required. We Americans have far more to be accountable for at the judgment of God than the Russians, than the Chinese, than the Germans or the Japanese. Why? We have more Bibles per capita than any nation in history. We have more churches than any nation in history. More money is spent on religious matters than any nation in history. We have television, we have radio carrying the gospel to the nation. We have the highest standard of living in history. We have more reason to live for Jesus Christ than any nation in the history of the entire world. And God is going to judge us by the opportunity he gave us. To whom much is given, much shall be required. There are people in China and Russia and Africa that would give their right arm to sit in the seat that you're sitting tonight and to have the opportunity of being in this great service. There are thousands that would like to sit beside their screen tonight and watch and hear the gospel preached, but they don't have a chance. But you do have a chance. You do have an opportunity. And you haven't re done anything about it. You haven't given your life to Christ. You haven't repented of your sin. You haven't trusted Him. You haven't given yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result, God is going to require much from you at the judgment. You say, well, Billy, I must confess I don't weigh enough tonight. If I had to stand before God tonight, I would have to plead, oh God, I don't deserve forgiveness and I don't deserve heaven and I would have to stand beside you and I would have to say with you neither do I but you know what happened God decided to do something about it for us God decided to pay the price of our redemption and so he sent his son Jesus Christ to the cross and Christ shed his blood and he purchased for us on that cross a righteousness that was not our own and now God says, you can weigh enough if you will come to my son. And it's like an old pair of scales in an old country store. Do you remember them? You put a weight on one side and on the other side you try to balance. And I try to balance the weight of God's law and of all God's requirements. And I fail. There is no balance. I know I'm lost. I know that I'm going to hell. What can I do about it? I say, well, I'll do a lot of good works and I put all my good works in, but that doesn't balance the scale because God says my good works apart from Christ are filthy rags. I try to reform, but I find within myself no strength and no power to live up to my resolutions. I do my best and I try to treat my neighbor as I should, but I don't treat him well enough. I try to live by the golden rule, but you don't. And so you can't balance the scales. And God said, no man will enter heaven and no man can be saved in this life or the life to come unless the scales balance. There's that sense in your life that you don't belong, you don't fit. You have frustration and inner tension. Your soul, made in the image of God, cries out for fellowship with God, but there is no fellowship with God. You are disturbed about it. And you try to put all these things into the scale, but they don't balance. And then one night, in a meeting like this, or in the quietness of your home, you get up out of your seat, and you come quietly to the cross and give yourself to Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, for the first time, the scales balance. And God receives you, not because you deserve it, he receives you on the basis of the work that his son did at the cross. That he was willing to go to the cross and die for you. And God raised him again from the dead to testify to all of history that God had accepted his atonement in our place. And now God clothes you in a righteousness that is beyond yourself. And God receives you because of Christ. And when God looks at me tonight, he doesn't look at Billy Graham and all of his failures and mistakes and sins. God looks at the robe of righteousness that I have been clothed in by the grace of God through Christ. 
And God offers to every one of you a pardon for all of your sins tonight. He says, I want to forgive and to forget the past. He said, I want to change your nature and give you a peace and a joy that you've never known. I want to give you a strength and a dynamic and a new dimension to your life. I want to transform you. And when you die, I want to take you to heaven. Will you give your life to Christ tonight? Will you surrender your will to Him? You say, well, Billy, do we have to come forward? Jesus said, if we're not willing to confess Him before men, He'll not confess us before the Father which is in heaven. And Jesus wants you to act on your will. And coming forward, there's something about it, that coming forward is an act of your will by which you receive Christ. I'm going to ask hundreds of you to get up out of your seat tonight and come and say, Tonight, I want to weigh enough. I want to be clothed in that righteousness. I want Christ in my heart. You might be a member of the church. You might be a Sunday school teacher or a deacon, but you've really never come to Christ. You're not sure that you're ready to meet God. You're not sure that you weigh enough. But you want to be sure. I'm going to ask you to come. If you're with friends and relatives, they'll wait on you. Just get up out of your seat, hundreds of you, and come right now. And say tonight, I want Christ. I want my past forgiven. I want a new life. I want the joy and the peace and the new dimension and the new dynamic that He can give. I want to receive Him as my Lord and Master and Savior. You come. Young people, whole families, men, women, whoever you are, just get up out of your seat and come and say on this memorial weekend, I want to present myself to Christ. And after you've all come, You'll stand here quietly and reverently. And then we'll give you some literature before you go and have a moment of prayer and a verse of instruction, a verse of scripture and a word of instruction. But you come right now from everywhere. Just get up out of your seat and come right now and say, Tonight I give myself to Christ. You say, but it's a long way from way back in these balconies where I'm sitting. I know it is. But Jesus went a long way to the cross for you to purchase your redemption. Certainly you can come a few steps and give your life to Him. We're going to wait on you. And I want everyone here to be bowed in prayer, quietly and reverently. The choir is going to sing just as I am, and as they sing, you come quickly from everywhere. Just get up out of your seat and come.